Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you're in your afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, uh, I am uh, Matt Inchenthrone, um, and you won't be quizzed about my name later. And with me uh, is uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, I can only say his first name, Gian. Uh, Hi, Matt. So, Gian, you want to give the folks your last name? Uh, it's 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 going to be in the quiz at the end, but yeah, <laughs> we call them. That's that. It's a tongue twister, and I, I challenge anyone to try it out. Yes, uh, first first mine, then his. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. So the awesome thing here is, in the last uh, few weeks, we've been able to ship a a nice, tightly integrated build of uh, Catchbase Server 4.0 as a developer preview. Um, the developer preview term, I know not everyone uses that, but at Catchbase, what we have is we'll do a developer preview followed by a, a beta. Sometimes there will be a beta f refresh if required and then a GA. And so developer preview, the cool thing about this 4.0 developer preview is it brings together a few features that we've been working on somewhat in isolation, and now it makes it really easy for uh, developers to, to understand uh, what we're able to do with Couchbase uh, in 4.0. So uh, uh, John is uh, uh, heads up product management with respect to 4.0, and so he's been um, uh, working with uh, a lot of the product management team and different engineers as we uh, and even other users as we try to figure out what uh, how we um, improve upon what we've done in 3.0. So Gian, I might turn it over to you. Uh, what's new and upcoming here in 4.0? What, what are folks able to get their hands on right now? There's uh, there's a lot, but um, I think the top areas that that we're we're enhancing is uh, number one is query um, and how you can query your data on how you can interact with that drastically changes in 4.0. Um, the, the way in which we're going to enhance that is, is give you a way um, to talk to us in SQL. Um, and you can talk to us in any of the other um, variety of ways that you prefer. SQL doesn't have to be your uh, direct exchange language. Um, but, it, uh, but, but SQL gives us and, and builds a, a great familiar interaction mechanism uh, with you and your data um, and, and gives you the ability to query data in many different ways. One of the great enhancements in it is the ability to um, take advantage of a variety of different type of indexes. And that's another huge area that's coming in 4.0. Um, we have a technology that allows you to index data today with incremental MapReduce. Um, we're continuing to support that, but we're going to augment that and add a new type of indexing, uh, a, an indexer called global secondary indexes. So you can use either of these indexers um, to index your data, uh, but with global secondary indexes, Nickel uh, can now create the right type of index um, for the query that you want to run. And, and that's a uh, that's a very interesting area of advancement. The, uh, another area that, that we've, uh, we're bringing in that I think makes Couchbase extremely unique is uh, the multi-dimensional scalability capability. So it, it, it takes a few words to explain this, so bear with me, but um, it, it essentially is your ability to take variety of workloads that compete with each other on a single node and isolate them to specific subsections of your cluster. In, in a way, create zones within your cluster that, that are dedicated to the workload and give you fine-grained control and, and much lower latency um, in how you scale your environment. So instead of doing a horizontal homogeneous scale-out where every node takes an equal slice of the work, you can now independently um, take uh, a workload like indexing, for example, and put that on a separate subset of nodes within your cluster. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they benefit from a different scalability model, uh, because of your workload, let's say uh, you, you're running type of queries that really don't benefit from scatter gather a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you can minimize the network uh, overhead and scatter gather overhead that 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 actually comes with that. So it it essentially creates this flexibility of you can do what you're doing today, which is to to homogeneously scale out and continue to add nodes, but it also allows you to take uh, building blocks and essentially um, independently scale them and uh, have, have fine-grained control so the administrator and the developer 
um, can can uh, make the right choices in terms of hardware choices. It's almost this this um, ability to kind of build the right type of uh, building for the type of interaction you want to have. So it's it's almost like you know your your uh, some of your services will love um, high rises. Some of your services will actually love the scaled out kind of single family housing. And you can build these different buildings that are at different heights uh, for the type of interaction that you want to have. If you want to build a concert hall. Um, you want a slightly different architecture and a resource and, and um, it, all of that um, variety can now be achieved as opposed to just having the single model of uh, scale up and scale out with a homogenous set of nodes with, with MDS. Yeah, if I picked up on that correctly, would it be accurate to say, because uh, I've installed Dev Preview and I know, I know there are some boxes that you check when you yeah. set up uh, nodes on the cluster. So there's, there's the, the traditional services that are in Couchbase and then you have this new box for query and this new box for um, secondary indexing. Yeah. And so I'm guessing that if I'm an ops guy and, uh, and maybe the deployment I'm working with, say it has a whole bunch of ad hoc query then I may need a lot of query nodes because I have a lot of ad hoc query going on uh, and a lot of query processing. Or maybe I have a workload that is very heavy on, uh, on uh, the union or difference of a bunch of different secondary indexes. Um, I may not need that many query nodes, but uh, maybe I want some super fast secondary index nodes to be able to handle that. So that's basically what you're saying is that now I've got some real flexibility in where I'm putting services on this distributed system. Is that right? Exactly. exactly. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Um, so you said a little bit about, um, uh, I'm sorry, were you going to, I didn't want to interrupt. No, I, was, I was going to uh, just append one, one quick comment to it. I, sure. I think the ability to isolate these services, it's also um, you being able to kind of create the balanced hardware design for the service that you want to run. So sometimes um, it is the, the, the type of query would benefit from scale out fantastically. Uh, and sometimes you actually want to prevent the competition of indexing from your data ingest. And that's the most important um, hose that you never want to introduce latency to. So if you wanted to ingest data extremely fast, with, but still be able to index data and query data, but you don't want that impacting your, your core workload, this, this topology, this multi-dimensional scalability flexibility mm -hmm. um, really gives you that capability to set it up right. Cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can certainly see scenarios. I know with uh, yeah, a bunch of different Couchbase users, we've seen scenarios where people do a daily bulk load or they get a new data set that they have to import. That's more on the, uh, the, the, the big data uh, side, use case side of things more than the interactive apps, but we, we certainly see both out there. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned uh, that I wanted to try to understand a little more was uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Nickel, so the new query language. I know a bunch of people, have, you know, we've been working on that for a while and we had it as a sort of an unbundled component. Now it's bundled, which makes it really easy for people. Um, how did we come to Nickel? What were the alternatives we looked at? What, what was it that we saw that was uh, uh, best there with uh, Nickel? So it, it is, if you, if you look at the, the kind of history of uh, querying data, that there's obviously a lot of choices. SQL is at the center of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, the early implementations and late implementations, too. Um, so just looking at the landscape, going back this, um, relational theory and SQL uh, in general, they're not necessarily tied together, but um, SQL implementation um, goes back even further than myself. It, it is older than me. So it, it has existed for a very long time. The side effect of that is it, it actually is known by a lot of people. Um, another important aspect of SQL is um, it, it really provides a, an effective way of communicating how you want to manipulate your data. And, and that, that's not just the manipulation of insert, update, deletes that you want to make and small modifications, but it's also reshaping of your data. You, you can express uh, a very complicated set of verbs through this language really effectively. So those were some of the changes, but there, this is not the only, only alternative out there. Um, uh, to really do it, so it's a good question to, to kind of go through uh, what what the decision process was like. It's it's there's always obviously with, with um, every choice there, there's multiple options, and in this case, uh, we could have looked at uh, 
APIs. Uh, we could have looked at um, a much kind of lower level type of uh, implementations. And I, I think there's no, <coughs> excuse me, there's no shortage of implementations of data manipulation. But mm -hmm. when you look across the, the field, I think the, the kind of breaking, tipping kind of rationale for this was um, if, if you look at big data space and if you look at MapReduce and some of the other things where, where divergence happened away from kind of SQL, um, people still find themselves coming back to the same type of words and SQL seems to be a very effective way of expressing that. So that really drove a uh, majority of our discussions here uh, for, uh, for picking SQL and, and why we pick SQL. I think it also, um, it is an interesting bridging technology too. Um, SQL, even though it is not necessarily tied um, to relational semantics all the time, everybody who's used it has uh, interacted with data through rows and columns. Now, what we've done with Nickel is stretch the surface of SQL to, to really be a lot more flexible about what it returns. And it, it, in the case of Nickel, it does not actually return rows and columns, but it is much easier for an ODBC, JDBC driver, which is trying to bridge a legacy tool, a, a tool that understands rows and columns, now has a much easier time talking Nickel. Uh, mm. And it's, it's this bridging technology. If you look at kind of the data management world, I, I worked on a few of them, but there are hundreds hundreds out there literally in terms of tools that will visualize your data, that they will massage it, move it, um, manage it, uh, report on it. There are so many tools to connect into. It was important for us to be able to kind of bridge and not be an island and not, not be kind of this isolated segment of data between the old world and the new world. And, yeah. and I think Google also brings in that facility of ODBC, JDBC, and, and, and just the translation that, uh, that, that you have to do is minimized because your your SQL, even though your SQL is much more extended beyond what what relational is. Well, cool. Uh, so the language ends up then looking mostly like uh, like SQL. Do, is there something you, you can maybe show us? Uh, give us a, yeah, a sense let me, of things. Yeah, I'm going to show you what what it looks like. It's it's. Um, by the way, just a note to uh, our viewers out there, if you have a question, go ahead and post it with the Q&A app, and then I see the questions, and I can uh, relay those to uh, Gian. So Gian, well, go ahead while, I, while people are typing and furiously typing in their questions. Oh. All right. Let me... Um, there we go. Over. I, I, I just want to quickly start kind of giving a, a, the uh, short tour of... What so this I is 4.0 we're looking at here. This is 4.0, yes. Yeah, so, okay. so let me let me walk through that first, and then we'll jump in. And I bet most of the viewers won't be able to tell the difference between Nickel and SQL in the beginning. But I'll 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 tr try to highlight a couple of the things. So this is you, this should look familiar if you've used Couchbase in the past. Uh, it's a cluster overview page uh, on the server nodes page. One of the things that you will realize is um, now that every node can actually get a, a service assigned to it. Um, this is an artifact of what, what we were talking about and uh, the, the ability to kind of separate these services. Now, each node can contain all three services, the data, index, and query service. But when you add a node, um, you get this ability to check or uncheck a variety of services that you want to run on that specific node. And it's um, in, in this instance, what I've actually done is added four nodes of data service, uh, which is what you know as Couchbase 3.0. It's, um, it is enhanced, but if you, if you functionally want to put a fence around it, that's what data service contains. Uh, the indexes, uh, the index service here is for the new global secondary um, indexes. This is the new indexer that I was talking about. And, and the query node uh, is the CBQ engine, the nickel engine that, that executes your queries. So. The other interesting aspect of this is uh, some of these nodes actually have different uh, resources assigned to them. So you'll see that the data nodes are actually uh, half the number of processing capability and, and uh, memory uh, when it comes to their, their hardware resources. They're I'm trying to be economical, so they're fairly small nodes. Uh, but I have double the core uh, capacity and double the amount of memory on the indexing service uh, and uh, query service. And that allows me to kind of build a cluster that, that really ultimately has the right um, resourcing for each service. Uh, this, is, this is how I configured my environment to, 
to run. And the buckets, I, I have a couple of buckets. There isn't a whole lot uh, that is different. Maybe uh, one thing I'll touch on before I leave is um, the index tab. Uh, this is in 4.0, you can, uh, besides views, you can see the global secondary indexes that you've uh, created in the environment. And that's, uh, that's the view you get. There's a couple of other things I want to touch on, just so some of my uh, PM buddies are not, are not upset. Um, there's, uh, there, there is uh, LDAP capabilities. I haven't touched on this in the first question. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of security enhancements in this product. Uh, so if you're interested in security, complying with security standards, internal or external uh, security compliance requirements, uh, these become extremely handy. One of them is our LDAP authentication and uh, your ability to, to, to now manage accounts through this external account management facility. And um, another one is the auditing capability. Um, so you can now find out what each admin uh, ad ad admin has done on the environment. If, if there was an added node or a, a drop the buckets, you could, you could actually do forensics and find out. So this is, this is the quick tour. Let me uh, switch over to my screen where I have um, a query window open. And many of you who come from uh, uh, other databases may actually recognize uh, uh, some of the things I'll, I'll type in here. But I'll, I'll start with. Um, I think I recognize that data set. <laughs> there you go. Yes, if you're a beer fan, you, you definitely will. Uh, so this query that I run uh, is the one that will just hit the system metadata and, and return uh, buckets uh, to us. It's called key spaces in, in the nickel language, and that's the reference. And it turns out I have three buckets, the beer sample, um, game data, and travel data. So um, it's, it's essentially a way for me to query the system and find out what type of information I can query. Uh, I can query things like. Um, indexes that, that exist on the system. And uh, there are a variety of types of query, uh, indexers, as I said. Uh, there is the GSI indexes, the global secondary indexes, or views uh, that can be used. Um, I can discover what type of indexes I've created, what conditions, and what um, fields I've actually um, uh, indexed, uh, and which buckets they actually belong to. So there's a lot of metadata that, that will help you discover um, and reconstruct the statements that you actually run. Um, let's take a look at a uh, beer sample. Um, this could be a good first hello world query um, that you can run. Um, let's say limit 10 so it, it doesn't scroll infinitely away. Uh, but so this, this is, is the same uh, beer sam beer sample bucket that we've been shipping, I think, since version 1.8, right, or something. Like that's that. right. Yeah. That's right. This is um, the, the query is just just to kind of uh, park that at the top of the screen. Uh, this is the query. It, it essentially uh, goes and returns every attribute. <coughs> excuse me, every attribute uh, that exists in in the items that it will find in beer sample. It just randomly limits it to 10. So it, it could have returned everything. But um, it turns out the first one that came back is actually of type beer. I bet uh, if you look through, there will be some that are actually breweries themselves um, uh, that are not type beer. So I could do something like this. I could, I could actually say, well, instead of this, why don't I actually say where mm -hmm. type equals beer? Uh, and um, run this query, and I'm, I'm going to get 10 rows now that will filter on this field. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, this is great. This, this hopefully looks extremely familiar to you. I could, uh, I could return something like the name of each beer, for example, just to simplify the output. One of the things I want to highlight is the, the result itself. Uh, the result comes back as, uh, as an XML output, uh, sorry, as a, as a JSON output. And that gives you a much closer fidelity to the, to the data that you have um, uh, and you want to manipulate in your application. Now, this JSON that comes back uh, and the SQL that you issue doesn't have to be the way in which you interact uh, with your data. There are, there are high level frameworks that will, um, that will come into play that will say uh, for, a, for a .NET developer, 
a link type query can be the interaction uh, for you. Or um, if, you, if you're looking for an ODM, um, there's a wonderful uh, Ottoman that, that will actually allow you to kind of have a, um, an interaction that's much more native. And you won't have to type in SQL. But for the, for the guys who actually love looking at data um, and um, want, want to be a little more hands-on uh, in the details of SQL, um, this is the interface that, that will actually give you that native capability. So um, look at it as SQL as an option, and, and SQL allows us to kind of build on top of it really, really comfortably as well. One other thing I want to I touch on here is um, this is a good, good example, but um, there's also good familiar troubleshooting capabilities that are, that are in here as well. So if you want to run an explain statement and see what the execution plan looks like for a, for a query that you're running, uh, you can also see that. For those of you who kind of looked at execution plans in the past, this should be fairly familiar. It's a set of operators that are assembled together to, to kind of go execute uh, the results that you want. Uh, what's fantastic about this is obviously if you create an index that benefits this query without changing the query, you can make it run faster. Um, in this case, I just just for kicks, let's let's kind of scroll through it really fast. It, it happens to do an index scan on an index called beer underscore brewery um, that's there. It, it is looking for um, the, the equals is expressed as a range here, so it's looking for beer. And then uh, there's parallelization that comes into play uh, here when we're fetch fetching the data when mm -hmm. when we want to return the name. That doesn't happen to be in the index, so we have to go to the data service and, and grab some of that back. Uh, and with uh, the limit operation at the end, we can, we can limit the result set. Now, um, it is kind of a streaming operation between all of these operators. Um, so limit is one of those interesting operators that will push itself up the tree, up the stream. Uh, when, we, when, when the stream of results start coming in, when we reach 10, limit is just going to cut the query off at that point and say, I have enough data uh, to return. So that's, that's kind of the way in which operators, operators work. Um, it's there, kind of a core, cool but sorry, hopefully sorry to interrupt. There are a couple questions here that have popped up in the uh, Hangout, so I want to get, the, get those in. Um, okay. So uh, Dariam Urquiza, I apologize if I've gotten your name uh, wrong, Dariam. Your name actually looks easier than both uh, Gian's and mine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he says, uh, I suppose the cluster configuration is updated to the Couchbase client the same way failover updates work. It does. It does very much so. And, and the topology itself can spread uh, dynamically um, uh, across the node. So it, not every node has to have uh, query or indexes or data service. So uh, the client libraries will, um, as soon as they connect in, to, to one of the nodes, they'll, they'll actually discover the topology of the cluster, understand which nodes are available to them for yep. issuing a variety of these functions. And yes, the nickel queries will actually go to the node that will, that will, that will execute the nickel query uh, dynamically. You don't have to know which, which uh, specific um, nodes within the cluster that is. Uh, will dynamically discover it. And as the admins kind of fail over and change and rebalance or add capacity, all of that gets communicated automatically to, uh, to the client. Awesome. OK. There's uh, actually one other question also from uh, Dariam. Uh, Dariam asks, uh, which servers are for query or index, or is it transparent to the catch-base client? So I think we've pretty much addressed that one already, but I, I don't know if there's anything you'd add. Yeah, I think, I mean, as I said, you can, you definitely get the control over exactly what you assign to each node. And as I add, I can certainly make um, any of the choices I'd like, um, whether I have all three services or, or only have one of these services, I could turn off one of them. Uh, but with that, the client doesn't have to, uh, well, well, the app developer doesn't have to know anything about any of this uh, other than the fact that um, it, the, the application logic based on the query or the KV operations will actually divert the traffic to the right service uh, that will give that functionality. So this is, a complete separation of the admin concern from the application concern. The admin is concerned about sizing the cluster correctly, and the uh, application developer is only concerned about uh, running the app logic. And everything in between is automatic through the SDKs. 
Awesome. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, take you off track, but I wanted to make sure Darium's questions got in. And by the way, anyone uh, who's out there watching the broadcast, if you uh, hit the Q&A there or just uh, post a comment on the um, Google Plus page for the event, I'll uh, definitely work those questions in. So back to you, Gian. Yeah. So um, this is this is kind of the basics of what I wanted to show. Um, the the CDQ interface is kind of that command line tool that, that allows you to interact with this. Obviously, um, I, I'm, uh, I think I'm repeating some of this, but it's, uh, you can, you, if you wanted to have a native experience directly into uh, Couchbase from a language like C Sharp or Java, um, there are native SDKs that you will be able to download and work with. Obviously, all of those SDKs, if, if you download them today, you actually have these uh, capabilities there. Um, if you want to up level from that into a, a much level, a higher level ODM, um, you will be able to do those things. So um, don't feel like this is the this is the only way that you can uh, get in and look at the data or SQL is the way. But um, it, there are many options that uh, this allows us to build on uh, with the capabilities. Uh, the indexing piece is also interesting. Maybe maybe we'll actually uh, kind of do um, a quick. Um, create index statement, um, and there's there's a number of different types of indexes that you can create. Uh, let me start with a primary index. Um, so this would be the statement that would that would create. Uh, travel, uh, a, a primary index on travel sample. And a private primary index essentially is uh, kind of your old docs interface, if anybody uh, remembers the history on that uh, with Couchbase. But it essentially is a list of all the keys that exist um, in, the, uh, in a given bucket. And it. Um, it could be useful for ad hoc type queries. Typically, you will, you will have a dedicated index to support um, the queries that you repeat a lot in the system, uh, but a primary index can can allow you to do a full scan uh, of the bucket, and um, uh, it 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 is one of those type of indexes. So um, it, it allows you to do this. The another maybe interesting syntax to look at is create index, and create index on travel sample um, can actually uh, this is this is a secondary index uh, or a non-primary index, it's a secondary index that can actually include um, things like type or fields uh, that you want to index. Uh, you can do multiple, um, multiple fields in here. Um, another capability that we have with indexes is to filter them. Mm -hmm. um, and something like this would actually work, uh, where you would only index uh, where name equals California or CA. Uh, in your data. So you, you don't have to index the entire data set. Uh, you can be selective about the parts of the data that you index. And this allows you to kind of uh, continue to be flexible in the, in the way you want to model your data. You can put everything into a single bucket um, and, and still create indexes that, that really kind of target specific areas of your data. Um, another important aspect of, of uh, kind of uh, indexing is that not only do you have, you get the GSI indexer, which is uh, which is kind of the new indexer, uh, but you can also specify a view, and uh, the view index could actually be a way that you could um, uh, you could um, index as well. Uh, the two different types of indexers, uh, what what it actually provides is the ability to um, have an autonomous partitioning strategy. So views uh, live in the data data service; they're they're aligned to the way the data is distributed. Uh, they're directly right next to the data that that uh, needs to be indexed. Um, GSI indexes are um, they they are essentially autonomously distributed. They they reside on the index nodes, and um, they they essentially don't have to be aligned to the way the data is distributed. And if uh, if if your queries could benefit from that, and there are many types of queries that will benefit from that, that that is a great uh, capability with GSI. But so one, one advantage I would think to using view indexes in some cases, I, I can see where GSI indexes because it's automatically going to distribute it among the cluster and probably isolates the, the um, operational complexity of the, of the index to as few nodes as, as, as possible. 
uh, unlike views, which is going to be scatter gather. But I guess one advantage to views is uh, obviously if you have multiple ways that you're querying the data already, it can use that, that same underlying view. Say you're saying using that same view for an aggregation or something like that. It's possible to use that, correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah, exactly. awesome. And so we're, we're still working through uh, the kind of um, scenarios that this is obviously um, a, a platform and people would use them in many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, We'll have guidance around this. Um, the, we're actually seeing the GSI index kind of be uh, very powerful in certain cases. Um, so yeah, that, I think there are uses for both of these type of indexes in the in the in the engine. Awesome. Okay, sounds good. That's that's pretty much what I had. Uh, that's that's kind of my dance around the product. <laughs> Um, to show. Yeah, and uh, yes. for those who are viewing, we're certainly going to cover uh, in the future um, what, how, how this surfaces up into the different languages. Uh, Gian mentioned it, but just uh, so, to summarize, I know in, in, in Java we have an API. Sometimes it's called a DSL uh, by Michael, the, the guy who's pretty much the architect for that to me, technically. Sorry, Michael. It's not really a domain-specific language, but it's a nice uh, Java fluent API way to kind of type your way through uh, putting queries together. If you're doing .NET, um, uh, uh, the the, um, the the main way to do that is link. Uh, and so I know uh, we're working towards a link provider there. Uh, and then uh, the other one that uh, Gian mentioned briefly is I know we're working towards Ottoman, uh, which if you're doing Node.js, uh, that's actually kind of a pretty cool high-level way to program against a uh, an app and, and just have a lot of the, the magic happen it's, um, uh, and it, and if you're if you fear the term ODM because it sounds like an ORM uh, recognize that um, here we're not we don't have um, correct me if I'm wrong but we don't have the same kind of impedance mismatch so you won't end up with the the that upper layer generating the query from hell because it's going to be a lot a lot more uh, you know clearly if you're in Node.js you're going from something that speaks JSON to something that speaks JSON so yep. pretty easy to do. Um, there, there's also this other feature. Uh, so you talked a little bit about uh, secondary indexes. Uh, what more might we uh, want to know about uh, secondary indexes in, in a deployment? Is there anything that needs to be managed, anything that I need to, to work with in, in its case, or anything unique about it? Yeah, so secondary indexes, uh, a brand new technology, but but it's been in development for for quite some time. Uh, so um, it, it's DP it's, is uh, the first time that's shipped, I think, right? Because previously we had query unbundled, but you couldn't really get secondary indexes. It, it was it was a repository sitting out on GitHub, and if you knew how to wire, well, actually, nobody knew how to wire the pieces anyway, together because yeah. we hadn't wired them together yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, global secondary indexes, I mean, this new type of indexer essentially is, is very interesting in the way it which uh, maintain things. So one of the interesting things about it is obviously because it doesn't sit on the node itself that, um, that captures the data, the data service, which, which kind of takes the in, uh, ingest, um, hands off the, the changes to the GSI index, uh, it, it's got a piece that, that actually runs on um, the data service that will optimize what we need to ship across um, the network to the index itself. So uh, this, this piece called the router um, and the projector uh, is responsible for capturing the changes that are happening to data and then optimizing the change to the relevancy of the indexes you have in your, in your environment. W what is interesting is, let's say, if you're, if, if you're um, uh, creating an index on only the beer type, um, or if you're indexing only a bunch of fields, there's a whole bunch of optimizations that the router and the and the projector will do to make sure that the traffic on uh, that that hits the index is directly relevant to the index that that you're um, you're shooting into. So it is it is very optimized data in, index maintenance operation and an index uh, maintenance architecture that allows us to kind of decouple uh, it, the the expensive parts but also push the optimization closer to data when it's needed. And um, there is, uh, the index service itself runs uh, under a process called indexer, and that is responsible for both maintenance of the indexes that are local to it. So each index service node will actually have it. It, it also is responsible for 
um, responding to the queries that are coming in with scan requests for uh, the execution plans that have been generated by the nickel query. So it is it is managing both of these kind of um, walls and, and making sure that the requests are balanced. Um, what is interesting also about it is in combination with nickel, um, as opposed to views, which, which kind of provide you um, kind of this coarse grain dials for consistency, which is stale equals okay or false. Um, we've architected uh, both nickel and uh, global secondary indexes to, to give you a lot more of the colors in between the two. So for those of you who don't know what these things are, is you can be uh, kind of very strictly consistent with a flag called stale equals false, or can be unbounded on your consistency and just query what whatever's available to you with stale equals okay. These are two extremes, and, and there are a number of different colors in between. Uh, things like read your own write, for example, can actually be very effective and low latency if, if you can relax your strict consistency to, I only need to read the thing that I just wrote 10 milliseconds ago. So expressing that into the system becomes a lot more interesting. Indexes do a yeah. lot of magic behind the scenes to, to really give you that consistency dial. Um, and uh, they can be a lot more effective in how they how they how fast they can respond to some of these uh, type of requests. Um, another interesting aspect of secondary indexing, just um, I, I know I'm going through the laundry list, but the way we cache and uh, store data with indexing uh, yeah. is run on our new storage engine that we're also showcasing for the first time called Forest DB. And, oh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah, so the interesting thing about ForestDB, that um, within our general architecture, we, we have storage engine um, uh, engine actually manage the data service data, the view data. Uh, but with secondary indexing, we're bringing in the next generation storage engine uh, called ForestDB. And ForestDB uh, provides a great deal of enhancements. It's, it's, it's a conversation as to, as to you know, how it actually does this magic, but essentially it will be an extremely effective, uh, effective storage engine for SSDs. It will still be great for Rust drives if you want to um, just talk Rust to them. Rust drives. <laughs> uh, or, or, yes, yes, hard, hard drives. I, should, I, should I haven't it. heard that term, but it makes sense. <laughs> I should, I should use right Ferrous term. oxide drives. That, that's right. That's right. And uh, so, if you're if you're running on SSDs, there there's a whole bunch of interesting um, concepts you can take advantage of, and, and ForceDB does a lot to do that. But it's also structurally different uh, from uh, CouchStore uh, and the existing storage engines we have uh, within the product in the mm -hmm. way it, which it maintains our kind of append only uh, file operations and the tree structure that we maintain. So. Yep. Uh, you can basically think of our, our existing uh, storage structure. If you're, if you're storage engine uh, engine um, kind of enthusiast, you, some of these will make sense. So I'll, I'll throw these in. But uh, it, it essentially is a B3. Uh, as you append, we don't overwrite the page, but we we, we kind of uh, append to the end and invalidate uh, references to to the existing page. Uh, mm -hmm. but that results in write amplification, and the depth of your tree is quite important for uh, for how much the write amplification amplification is going to be. Uh, the B plus three has has kind of interesting capabilities. It's obviously widely used, but uh, for CB uses a new structure called B plus try um, that was presented a couple of years ago at ACM, uh, and um, it it essentially. Uh, the end result is it, it is a collapse tree that is a lot more effective uh, for the storage format that that uh, we're supporting. It it essentially results in a great deal of improvement on the number of levels, especially on a on a large data set, number of levels that the index have to maintain. So the end result is when you do um, a, a million writes, the amount of I/O operations that translates into, which is the effect of write amplification. Is much smaller in ForestDB compared to um, our, our uh, older engines that, that are out there. And, and got it, got it. Magic happens through ForestDB. So secondary indexing builds on top of it. It, it just gives it uh, so much more steam and power to, to kind of uh, give you effective indexing. Yeah. So so I, I guess uh, uh, a, a dramatic simplification of that was one fair way to say it would be. Um, really, we've kind of looked out and said, okay, it, when you go to EC2 today and you boot a system, it says, would you like to use SSD, where in the past it used to be, um, 
what kind of what did you call it rust uh rust, rust uh, yeah rust storage yeah you know that used to be the default and now the default's actually changed yeah. to ssd and so we have now uh created that next generation um storage engine based on ideas that have been around in computer science for a while to kind of optimize for that kind of environment and i know there are a bunch of other benefits like i if uh, i know uh forest db it, it ends up being sort of funny um it while it works really well here the other place that most people uh whoops sorry for bumping my machine there the other place that most people uh use ssds is on these things right so they'll uh, they'll take their their mobile device and so i know the catchface mobile team has been looking at well how, how do how will forest db uh, pop in to the database we embed in the mobile devices well that's pretty they awesome believe they may actually get to the finish line before we do oh uh, really forest db out yes yes so we're, we're on a we're on a tight race uh across <laughs> the two teams to try to try to see who can ship ForestDB first, whether mobile database will ship it or, or CatchBase Server. And, and ForestDB was another one of those things that was a, a source code repo that was out on CouchBase, uh, github.com slash CatchBase that had an Apache 2 license on it. But so far, nobody's actually used it to, except us until we had shipped um, 4.0 DP. There's actually another question out here. So uh, let me pull that question up. The uh, question is from uh, Nikos uh, Chisanis. Uh, Apologies if I got that incorrect, um, but Nikos asks. Uh, it's a little bit of a uh, yeah. Well, Nikos, asks, we'll, we'll, I'll let you evaluate the question for yourself. Nikos says generic questions, or sorry, generic question. Would you use Catchbase 4.0 for simple, low-scale applications and websites, or is it still, as I used to say, an ICBM type of DB? And it's probably a waste of technology because it can handle good resources, not so needed in low scale. So I guess he's saying, you know, does, does uh, is 4.0 more appropriate for those environments where you just have some pretty simple needs compared to uh, the past? I'm, I'm, so good question. I, and I, I take this as, you know, my terminology for this is, uh, can this thing scale down? Really well. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Scaling goes both ways, and people don't yeah. always think about that, right? But yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, my background, I'll, I'll I'll just throw this in just just uh, for uh, for the uh, for the folks who um, uh, who may be curious. My background is uh, a lot of databases. This is my fifth database. I've, I've worked on quite a few um, at Microsoft uh, uh, and prior at Informix, Illustra, um, Azure. Um, so a lot of us uh, who kind of look at the technology, um, we're, we're, uh, there, there's a lot of capabilities you build into monolithic architectures, and, and that becomes fatty and fatty, and I, I understand this question. Um, Uh-oh. More functional. Um, there's weight. There's weight that constantly pulls you down, and when you want to do something simple, they're just not able to unscrew these these heavy uh, heavy tires, and you cannot get back to your bicycle again. It becomes yeah. this giant truck, and and it's very hard to unscrew things. Yeah. Um, the catchbase is very different, uh, and and it is unique in the sense, um, in my view, because um, it is not a monolithic architecture, but this decoupled architecture that allows you to kind of unplug many of these pieces. So even though we can be this this rocket ship you can you can still unscrew enough pieces and there are pieces in there that that will actually if, if you just wanted to do something very simple uh it, it can turn into a bicycle and and you can still run with that and uh, frankly uh i think one of the things that you can you can look at is uh what it takes to run a certain set of operations with couchbase versus a relational database uh you'll actually see just the minimal resource consumption and, and the requirement for um, uh, for for Couchbase has has always been kind of very well constrained. So mm -hmm. if you if you don't want to enable these services, for example, right, all these new bells and whistles, all you need to do is uncheck those boxes, and you have your efficient KV store um, that's been there, and you can deploy that on a single node. Now you're losing redundancy, you're losing a whole bunch of functionality. But if that's what you want. You can actually get that, and it's still very effective in, in the way it handles data. So I think architecturally, we're, we're configured well to scale down. And I, I, I think my answer to this, to this generic question would be yes. 
<laughs> Great. Uh, thanks much. Uh, thanks for the question, Nikos. Uh, so um, uh, with that, uh, uh, if anyone else has any other questions, please by all means uh, post them and we'd be happy to answer them. Um, the other thing I, I, I will mention while I'm waiting for a couple more questions, this is uh, my opportunity to go uh, share a screen. Um, of course, uh, we, we've hidden Couchbase uh, 4.0 dev preview in a, a really um, uh, hard to find place, couchbase.com slash download. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, dev preview is that period of time where we ask you to try things and give us some feedback. So it's the best opportunity right now if, if there's something that you'd like to see or you're interested in, in letting us know uh, what, where, how it works for you or doesn't, that, that would be the best place to go. One other uh, quick mention is that we do have an event coming up really in about, I think it's almost three weeks away. Um, so Couchbase Connect, which is our annual conference. Um, this year it's in June, uh, and this year we've grown again. So we're actually at Levi's Stadium in Santa Clara. Uh, so moving down south from uh, San Francisco to Santa Clara this year. Um, and so, and if you're interested, uh, since since uh, those of you that hang, uh, come in for the hangout are are uh, extra cool, if you're interested in a, a way in to connect, which I think is a $599 value, uh, if you're looking for a way to defray some of that cost, wink, wink, uh, send myself or Gianna note on Google Plus or Twitter, and and, and we'll hook you up. Uh, and the uh, other thing, just to briefly mention, is uh, oops, I left the date out, but there are a couple of webinars coming up. Um, mobile peer-to-peer -peer webinar on May 12, and the uh, real-time big data webinar is on May 27, if I recall correctly. Um, uh, so definitely, uh, if you're interested in more information on, on mobile uh, webinar, uh, that, that one is going to show some pretty awesome stuff with uh, how you can use peer-to-peer. Um, so at this stage, uh, there are no other questions coming in. Uh, John, anything you wanted to close on? Anything that you've uh, thought of that uh, we haven't covered yet? Well, here's, uh, I, 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 this is my plug moment. So uh, here's what I'll take. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, there is a chance uh, of me making changes to the product, and it is this moment in time. When we ship the developer preview, we really ship it with the ambition that a lot of people will try it and give us feedback. So anybody who's, who's out there uh, who wants to give it a spin, I'm all ears. Uh, we, can, we can make changes to it. Once we ship it out the door, it becomes so much more difficult. Uh, but it is time to give feedback. So if you guys want to download this product, play with it, give us feedback. We're all ears. And uh, forums are extremely active. We'll, we're, we're trying to make sure that we can, we can attend to every question. So it's a great way to interact with the dev team, a great way to find out about this product. And if you don't like something, it's time to tell us. And, and um, I have a good chance and a good shot at making that change. Absolutely. Uh, we yeah. did actually have one more question pop in uh, yeah. from uh, Dariam. Uh, Dariam asks, there was a community version in 2.5 and 3.0. What will the differences be between community and enterprise editions in 4.0? Great question. So this is still a discussion that's going on. Uh, and um, there's some interesting thoughts around what, um, what, what type of differences there needs to be. Um, one of the things, I, maybe I, I should kind of rewind back and repeat what we have on 3.0. Uh, 3.0 has a couple of things that are, uh, are enterprise-only features. These are the kind of complicated capabilities that we put into the product uh, that, that really we think enterprises really need. <clears throat> and those are security capabilities. So if you want uh, to encrypt your traffic over the wire, those are, uh, those are capabilities that you can enable in the enterprise edition. Uh, rack zone awareness, that gives you kind of smart placement of your replicas um, with Kitebase Server 3.0 and 2.5. Uh, that capability continues to be uh, enterprise edition. Uh, we have um, incremental backups. Uh, which, which is essentially a much more effective way of backing up your data as opposed to taking full snapshots of your data all the time. Uh, that's also an enterprise capability today. Uh, with the next version of the products, uh, we're looking at keeping security in that, in that realm. I think some of the security features I've shown 
Uh, there's a good chance that those uh, capabilities, LDAP and auditing, LDAP integration and auditing will, will actually be in the security area. Um, there's capabilities in XDCR that we're adding that will advance XDCR to the next level. Uh, one of them is filtering. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about many of these capabilities, and I'm sure I'm going to hear about that <laughs> after this. But uh, XDCR uh, may actually gain some capabilities. XDCR encryption today is, is what is... Um, uh, what is enterprise edition and filtering may actually come in as, as one of those capabilities too. So these are two that we're, we're kind of um, talking about at this moment. Um, there isn't, uh, we're, we're continuing to discuss, but this is another area where I'd love to hear feedback. Uh, as long as you don't say, give me everything for free. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and uh, yeah, uh, for sure. And I, I know our goal is always to make sure that developers can develop um, an app uh, entirely and that you can deploy an app and so that everything's available to you there. But obviously, as you get to a deployment level, um, it's only going to make sense for somebody who's deploying something to establish the right kind of you know relationship with the people who've written the software. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that it, yeah. And then, you know, it also... Uh, I, I know I know that I, I frequently will say you know what do you get with an enterprise edition subscription you give the you get uh, more of an opportunity to give me a hard time on a regular basis and so you'll have more <laughs> of a license to give uh, Gianna a hard time on a regular basis uh, so and all of the source is uh, Apache 2 uh, open source uh, all hanging out off of uh, github um, but you can only get the the enterprise edition as a binary that we've tested and uh, uh, put through uh, all of the QA paces and gone through the um, the, the other issues. The thing that uh, uh, that from Couchbase on uh, over at Couchbase.com slash download. So um, I'll I'll be very certain about a couple of things that are in though. Maybe that is uh, that's that's important to to note. I can tell you that indexing uh, capabilities and and nickel will actually be in the CE edition. So mm -hmm. it is, w when you're coding an application, we don't want you to be, um, uh, to be lacking a, a, a contract, an API that really can give you a powerful set of queries. So um, the, the, the ability to have query service, uh, you, you're going to have those capabilities, some of these new, new facilities we talked about, the ability to um, have um, indexing facilities. I think those are the types of things that uh, will be um, uh, will be in for sure, so that you can develop an application comfortably. And if there is a day where you have to explode in size and you 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 have to kind of go to a much larger, much more mission critical deployment, then your choice of going to EE is much simpler, and it doesn't require you to change your code. And that's that's what we want to ensure. Yep. Great. Um, and regarding uh, things like uh, cross data center replication and some of those other features, uh, by the way, that's what uh, John was referring to when he said XDCR. It's the acronym that we use for cross data center replication. Um, an ironic acronym in that it takes almost as long to say as the acronym, or as what it's an acronym <laughs> for. <laughs> <laughs> so, so cross data center replication. You know, we'll, we'll certainly have plenty of other future hangouts where we can drill into things like uh, what's awesome about Forest DB, what's happening in cross data center replication, um, how is this going to come together with uh, uh, the the other things happening in Couchbase Mobile, etc. So uh, don't worry about that. So um, with that, I think uh, I think we want to say thanks very much. Please do give us feedback on on the Hangouts. Uh, I know uh, we had a good number of people that were able to join us live here, which is great. And um, uh, it's always great when people even want to jump in occasionally to, to ask a question. Um, and uh, uh, we'll definitely do uh, more Hangouts in the future. This will be recorded out on YouTube so that the uh, others who were sleeping right now uh, will be able to uh, jump in and have a look. Uh, thanks, Gianna. Appreciate your taking the time. Uh, we'll say thank you. thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.